Welcome to the NHL 94 podcast, part of the CBP Media Network. This podcast is dedicated to the greatest game ever developed, where I will talk about the development of the game, tournaments and matches, our stories about NHL 94, the people that make up the NHL 94 community, the games won, lost, and the chirps that need to be heard around the world. Hello, 16-bit hockey fans, to yet another edition of the NHL 94 podcast. Today, I'm going to be joined by somebody who has a storied past. He's a freelance journalist. He's been with the Hockey News since 2011. He's the host of the Puck Junk podcast. He's wearing the wonderful shirt, if you could show it off, the lovely shirt over there. This man enjoys his hockey games, his hockey video games, in fact. In fact, he has talked to the legendary JR about NHL 94. So I present to you the man, the myth, the legend, Sal J. Berry. Sal, how are you, buddy? Oh, I, I thought that was when I was supposed to applaud. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Everybody's supposed to applaud. You're the guy that we're applauding for. So when I, number one, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show here and talk about uh, NHL 94 and a few other things. But yeah, yeah just secondly, is, this has been a long time coming uh, for people who are unaware. We've been trying to get this done for quite some time and um scheduling conflicts and then an illness and then technical issues well third time's a charm here we are but either with that being said Sal, Sal, thanks for coming on and uh, how are you buddy i'm doing great thank you for uh, putting this off a bit i was sick last time we tried to talk i had this like sinus infection cold uh allergy reaction to the change in weather whatever so i was just not feeling too great. So I'm, I'm glad that I can talk now and actually have my wits about me and sound halfway normal. I, my voice is normally this high, but at least I'm not congested or coughing or anything like that. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited uh, to get to talk hockey video games. My podcast, we mainly talk about hockey cards. We don't really talk about video games so much. So just having the opportunity to get to chat about NHL 94 with a mega fan like you is something I've been looking forward to. Nah, this is going to be a lot of fun, but we're not just going to talk about NHL 94. There's a few other things I want to talk about that as well. Like number one, for instance, you're based out of Illinois. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm in Chicago. Perfect. And it's a storied hockey town and the madhouse on Madison, uh, unfortunately, no longer there. But we could talk about that just a little bit. Just want to know what it is you started watching hockey and do you enjoy watching other sports as well? Um, I'll answer the second question first. No, I don't really enjoy watching other sports. I've tried. I've tried to get into baseball. I've tried to get into football. Football I can kind of get into. I can watch football. Just the Bears are such a terrible football team. But I grew up when they had the uh they had went on that run in 1985 and they won Super Bowl 20. So of course, when you know you first notice sports as a kid and you're like, oh, the Bears are a good team. Oh, and they won the championship, right? And then I didn't realize that for like the next 40 years, they would be disappointing. Um, But really what got me into sports was when I discovered hockey. And the thing about that is the Blackhawks were buried on cable television since the early 80s in Chicago. And they didn't televise their home games. Their road games were only on cable TV. We didn't have the money for cable TV in the 80s. In fact, I didn't know anybody with cable TV. And we finally got cable television in early 89. And I was channel surfing. And I stumbled upon a Blackhawks game. I I was flipping between two TV shows. And I hit, you'll appreciate this, you're in Canada? Yes. So, of course, you remember SCTV? Sure do. So I that to me was new. I had never seen SCTV before, but they were showing these reruns. So I used to watch SCTV whenever I could. And I was flipping between that and a biography about, about uh, Martin Luther King Jr., the civil rights leader. So I was flip-flopping between the two shows and I put in the wrong number and I ended up stumbling upon a Blackhawks game. So it was just totally by chance that I caught the last three minutes of the Blackhawks playing the Buffalo Sabres. And then they said, our next game will be Saturday. Tune in. And I said, okay, I'll tune in. And I did. And I watched that. And I remember, I don't know if it was later that night or if it was the next weekend, but then I watched another Blackhawks game. And then the game immediately after that was a Kings Penguins game in, in 1989. And I was hooked. 
to see Mario Lemieux and Wayne Gretzky play against each other. I mean, I was, couldn't think of two better teams to really sell you on the sport at that time. You know, even though the Penguins were not a great team in 89, they were on their way up and the Peng- the uh, Kings were, you know, the Kings and they had Gretzky. So, yeah, so that's kind of how I got into hockey. It was by accident. But then that was the first time I really said, this is a sport that I like. This is a sport that I want to watch. This is a sport that I want to collect. This is a sport that I want to like try to be involved in, in as many facets as I can. So that's kind of the long story, but it's just funny how everybody, well, no, not everybody, but certain things you inherit from your parents. Like a lot of Canadians have told me, oh, I don't remember how I got into hockey. It was just always there. So I just got into it. Right. And when you're a little bit older, it's like when you discover that, like that really good rock album or comic book or movie or something because somebody shows it to you, somebody shares it with you, or you just stumble upon it by accident and your life has changed. So it was really a life-changing moment for me in like a very good positive way. Yeah. And the Blackhawks in the eighties, just like the rest of the Norris teams, they were just a stepping stone for the uh, Patrick division. No, Smythe division. Sorry, Smythe division, Smythe division. Yeah. And, yeah. And the thing was, is that the Blackhawks did have competitive teams but yeah, they were like the best of the worst. Uh, they they did turn it around in the early 90s. I mean, when they had guys yeah. like Ed Belfort, Jeremy Roenick, Chris Chelios, you know what I mean? Then, then they started to really assemble a great team. And, you know, they made some pretty deep runs. They won the President's Trophy one time. Of course, they lost in the first round of the playoffs. But, you know what I mean? They became, to the Stars, too. North Stars with that. North Stars, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still scarred by that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was, you know, but yeah, you're right. They were kind of a stepping stone. But then again, everybody was kind of a stepping stone to the Edmonton Oilers by then. Yeah, it was either them or the Flames because between those two teams in the uh, eight, starting from 84, um, they it was either the Flames or the Oilers were in the finals. And yeah. uh, just they, they dominated such great teams from Alberta. And the, the Blackhawks at that time, they were rough and tough between like, uh, Al Secord, Ben Wilson, uh, Doug Wilson too is a, a tough as nails defenseman, but he could score goals as well. Just a, re- a really tough team to play against, and the smaller ice surface and mm-hmm. the, the the noise from uh, the Chicago Stadium. Do you have any memories of old Chicago Stadium that you want to share with us? Yeah, I mean, I think the first time I heard that goal horn, it scared the bejesus out of me and my friend because my aunt bought me tickets for my 14th birthday. I discovered hockey about two weeks before my 14th birthday. And then it was kind of like, my mom was like, Oh yeah, me and your aunt, we used to be hockey fans in the seventies. And I said, well, what happened? And then she's like, well, they stopped showing the games on TV. And so then my mom gives me this box of hockey memorabilia that she kept. It was including was a, um, a complete newspaper from when the Blackhawks won, or excuse me, when the Blackhawks lost one when they lost the 1973 finals I couldn't remember if it was 71 or 73 they lost both those years to Montreal but she saved like sports sections and complete newspapers of like the Blackhawks making it to the cup finals she had like old hockey illustrated magazines she had a postcard that was autographed by Guy Lafleur when she wrote him a fan letter and oh. he sent her back a postcard with like his own special stationery that just said Guy Lafleur in the corner you know where the return address would go it just said Guy Lafleur right and it like a little like logo or icon and so like she gave me her hockey stuff from the 70s And then my aunt was like, oh, yeah, we were both hockey fans. Here's my Tony Esposito jersey. You can borrow it. And I'm like, cool. (laughs) So then I had I had like a hockey jersey, you know, that I gave back to her once I got my own jerseys. But, you know, so like it it was kind of like in the family, like my my grandma used to take my aunt to the games in like the 60s. And so like when I finally got to go to a game for my birthday and it was in I remember it was February 10th of 1989 against the New York Islanders. Um, we're walking up to our seats and like the goal horn goes off and me and my friend just jumped. It scared the hell out of us. And that was such a cool memory that I, I still remember. I, I remember that. I remember like the way people would stomp their feet on the ground and um, the balconies, the first balcony and the second balcony were stacked one on top of each other, mm-hmm. like, a, like a birthday cake or like a wedding cake. So like the mezzanine up until like the sixth row was out in the open. And then you had like the first balcony and then the second balcony. So it was, um, you know, you feel when people would stomp their feet, you know, like trying to like make noise. 
and that was scary. I mean, even being up in the balcony, you'd feel it shake, you know, and they had like a bar because like a, like a, like a, like a safety bar so that like you wouldn't fall forward and on top of the person in front of you because the seats were staggered a lot higher. So you weren't looking around somebody's head. You were kind of looking straight down at the ice and you had this bar. But yeah, it was, it was a little, uh, you get a little bit of vertigo from that. And I remember during intermission, you'd walk out into the lobby and it would just be full of smoke because everybody go into the, <laughs> um, go, go into the lobby and, and smoke a cigarette. Two other quick memories I'll share. I remember the 90, um, conference finals against the Edmonton Oilers. And I just remember like some Yahoo was passing out sparklers and like during the anthem, like we all started, you know, like somebody would like somebody else's sparkler. So like everybody in our row were holding <laughs> up sparklers, and, which, you know, now you would never see that in a hockey game. Like, oh, look, that whole section of people or that whole row of people are holding up sparklers during the anthem. But it was just, it was just such a different time back then. I remember that. And I remember the going to the all-star game and then the national anthem and just how loud that was. Yeah. And people talk about how, like legendary that national anthem was um, during the 91 NHL All-Star Game. So, yeah, those are some of my memories. I mean, you know, I could go on and on forever, but we're here to talk video games, right? Yeah, no, I, I do have one last question, too, oh, because the legendary Nancy Faust, the organist that played in the old Chicago Stadium, but also she played at Comiskey Park as well. Did you yes. ever get to meet her? No, because by the time I got into hockey, their organist was Frank Pellico. Oh. So I did not get to meet her, unfortunately, but um, I've met Frank Pellico because he's been there since like the late eighties. And, you know, I've talked with him, got his autograph on stuff, got like a black Hawk book. He'd like sign out, send out like, um, or have like autographed photos that he would uh, sign for people at like the black Hawk convention and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, I never met her, unfortunately. And just the fact that you're in Chicago and you love, I guess, the, the Hawks more than any, anything else, you must then absolutely love NHL 94, the fact that JR, at least on the, the Genesis version, he's absolutely incredible. And so is the, the team. Like you, You've played the game before, right? Like, what are your memories of NHL 94, first playing it? And uh, yeah, I just want to hear about your thoughts on the NHL 94, the game. Well, I mean, I, I liked it since it was NHL hockey that came out during 91-92 for the Sega Genesis. My best friend, his brother had a Genesis. And so, you know, when you're like 15, 16, you don't really have anything to do on a Saturday night. You're like too young to go out clubbing. You know what I mean? You can't do much. You're too old to be in bed by 10, but too young to like go out anywhere. So what do you do? You just end up hanging out with your friend on a Saturday night in his bedroom you know, watching movies or he's playing guitar and I'm playing video games or whatever. And I remember his brother had NHL hockey for Genesis and I'd go there and play his Genesis because I didn't have a Genesis. I had a Nintendo. And so it was just exciting whenever I got to play Genesis. And I remember playing NHL hockey and just getting really into it right away. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is great. Five on five. It has real teams. It doesn't have names, but okay, we know who number 99 on the Kings is supposed to be or number 66 on the Penguins. It was super easy to like pick a fight. It was a lot of fun. It was just a fun game. And then I remember when NHLPA Hockey 93 came out for Genesis um, and Super Nintendo. I had a Super Nintendo by then. I mean, I got it kind of like... a. Not when that game came out, but when I finally got one, I bought that game for it. And I just remember like liking it because it was an improved version of the NHL uh, hockey game. And then when NHL 94 came out, honestly, I wasn't sure if I wanted to buy it yet because there were a lot of hockey video games that year. There was like uh, NHL Stanley Cup. I believe Pro Sport Hockey came out that year. I know... Um, ESPN Hockey Night either came out that year or the next year. There was also Brett Hull Hockey. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't know if that was the next season. I, I think ESPN Hockey Night was the next season. There's actually a funny story about that and a game that came out called Road to the Cup. I'll, I'll save that for later in the, in the podcast. I do want to talk about that, yes. Okay, I'm glad you got that on your radar. But So it was just like, well, do I want to buy NHL ho Stanley Cup Hockey? Because they were posting like Mode 7 graphics where you're always behind the player, and when you turn, the whole perspective turns. And that looked really cutting edge. And then I remember like I had a coupon for like that I could use for either 
NHL's Stanley Cup or Super Mario Kart? And I go, well, Mario Kart looks kind of fun and it's got good reviews. So I bought Mario Kart, but then I still needed to have a hot, a new hockey <laughs> game. So then like the next week I went and I bought NHL 94 and I'm glad that I did because, you know, I enjoyed the hell out of it. I had the Super Nintendo version. I got both versions now, but the one that I played was Super Nintendo. Me and my friend Steve, we would just, I'd go to his house. I'd bring the game. We'd play it there. We'd play it over by my house. Like I'd, I'd play against the computer or I'd play against like a friend. So it was a fun game. I mean, I remember ruining a friend's birthday party by bringing my copy of NHL 94 to his party because I go to his party and, you know, he has other kids over there. You know, we're all like in our teenage years and late teens. And um, he wanted to role play. He wanted to do like a, like not Dungeons and Dragons, but like another role, role play style of game. And I brought my my Super Nintendo and like my games, and he was like, "Oh, I thought we'd role play." I go, "Well, it's your birthday. We'll do whatever you want." But then the other kids saw that I brought a Super Nintendo, so then they're like, "Well, maybe we could hook up sell Super Nintendo and and just you know maybe like check it." You know what I mean? And then you know where that goes. So then it got to the point where like the people who weren't role playing, they would like run over and they'd like play a game. And then like my friend would be like, Hey, it's your turn to roll the dice. And then he'd like pause the game. One of them would roll over, uh, run over, roll the dice, do his thing and then run back. So I like felt terrible that like, I kind of ruined his birthday unintentionally. I thought I was making it more fun by bringing yeah. a, a, a next gen for the time console over. But then I remember like all of us just ended up like taking turns playing NHL 94. And because I was better than everybody else. I'd play as the ducks just to make it fair. <laughs> I, I, I play as the ducks and let the other people play as like the Eastern conference or Western conference, all stars just to keep it, um, you know, just to keep it kind of fair. Cause they were like figuring it out. And I was like, I knew what I was doing by that point. And you did the right thing. I think by first buying Mario Kart and then buying uh, NHL after that, because let's be honest, Mario Kart, even today is still a phenomenal game, phenomenal series. I'll never knock that. And if I have a chance to pick it up and play it, I would just because it's such a good, good game. Even the DS and the S version, I loved it's got such good memories, but I have a question. It sounds like to me, you guys did not have, or you didn't have the multi-tap that little device that enables you to hook up, I think up to five controllers to the S and the S so you could play multiple more than two people on the, the uh, NHL 94. Yes. So Correct. You, I didn't have it. I, yeah, it, too bad. It, at the time, it only came with Super Bomberman. Okay. I don't I know doing... if you could have bought it individually, but you, like, and so it was just kind of like a thing where, like, I think you had to buy a game to get it. So it seemed a little, like, yeah, like, oh, I got to buy this game. and But then it's just, like, I don't even think I knew, like, five, four other people who'd want to play it at the same time with me and then on top of that you know like more money more problems it's like okay well you buy a multi-tap well guess what now you got to buy three more controllers right yeah, so it just, true. just becomes more of a problem like when you're like 18 and you're just like okay i then now what do i do yeah you know what i mean i mean the, nothing was cheap back then i mean this game was like 50 bucks like yeah. and i i think like the coupon that i used for like mario kart i want to say it was something crazy like save seven dollars or something and it's like oh seven dollars off this game okay well i'm gonna buy that game then you know but uh yeah I, I i i will say that um when i got a playstation a couple years later and the only reason why i bought that game was so that i could play nhl two on two open ice well by then between me and my oh. friends now i'm in college we had four playstation controllers so i remember like being a film student going to film class. And then like, after that, we'd head back to the dorms and it's like the four of us sitting on the couch playing like the penguins versus the Blackhawks and, you know, getting like an actual two on two experience. So that, that's a lot of fun. And I think that is something that's missing from a lot of video games today is like being able to punch somebody sitting next to you after they like, <laughs> they beat your ass in a game. Then you're just like, what the hell? Right. Like, and we used to do that when we'd play Halo, we'd like link up like three Xboxes because we had free TVs. Because now I'm post-college, we're all like working real jobs and have like money, can afford PlayStations and TVs and lots of network cable to run everywhere because this is pre-Wi-Fi. And then you could like 
trash talk the person sitting next to you or get up and go in the other room and yell at the person or what, whatever. And now it's just like all on the internet with a headset. So there's definitely that like, kind of like that, that like visceral tangible, like I'm playing against somebody next to me and they're my friend, you know, now you're just playing some 12 year old kid. Who's like poning your ass. Oh, sorry. I don't know if I can swear. You I, can. You know, no, you that's can about as worse as I'm going to get here. <laughs> no problem at all. Sal. So just to give you a heads up, before COVID, so in 2019 and even in uh, or very early 2020, uh, my previous job, what we used to do, we all brought our old Xbox 360s and we all, we brought them into the special boardroom we had. We had the IT guy that was uh, on our side and we hooked them up. We had four screens and we used to play Halo in the same boardroom. This is just a few years ago, four years ago we were doing this. And so I truly, I still remember this vividly. Those memories are, are still very strong for me. So I, I had a lot of fun doing that. Two on two open ice. Did you play that at the arcade? I did. Great game. Did you happen to notice that Guy Bear, for whatever reason, was George Vesna reincarnated? For whatever reason, he seemed like the best goalie in that game. And there was he was like just a brick wall. And nobody was allowed to play with Anaheim because he was just too good. Does that do you remember that or am I just the only one dreaming this? I don't remember that. I know like when I played the coin operated version, um, like the mall that I worked a job at at the time had that. So I'd like go there after my shift ended and I'd go play NHL open ice. And it was just so cool. Like it, it would save like your data, right? You know, you type in your name and it would save your information. And so you could kind of, I think you could pick up where you left off. I, yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember now. Honestly, I do remember typing my typing in my initials. A few times, I didn't necessarily get high scores at that game, but you know, either way, what was great about that was the Black Hawk announcer did the play-by-play. -play yeah, he did. Because Midway Games is in Chicago, so they did you know Mortal Kombat, NBA Jam, NHL Open Ice. These are all Midway Games. They're in Chicago. Actually, I know the one of the programmers who worked on Open Ice and Mortal Kombat. He's actually a colleague of mine at the university that I teach at. So I brought that up to him before. And I think I sent him an NHL 94 article and he's like, okay, Sal, I'll allow one time for you to not talk about open ice. Cause that was the game he worked on. But yeah, I mean, um, it was, you know, the games were fun back then because they felt like games and not like simulations. And, yeah. you know, you show anybody like a new NHL game and to the uninclined, they always say, wow, this looks and feels like a TV broadcast. And I go, yeah, it does. But it also like, and that's okay. Maybe we like the presentation, but like the gameplay is just so like involved. And I get it. I mean, I have this, now I'm getting into more of like game theory, but I think for me, I lost interest in games when they moved away from being games and they moved towards being simulations. Because you look, once you move from 2D to 3D, first-person shooters, first-person view, uh, sports gaming, going 3Ds, uh, 3D, what did they do? They they tried to make these games more and more realistic. And so then the problem is, is that when something becomes too realistic, then it stops being fun. Because there's just, there's too many restraints on it. I mean, you've played Monopoly, right? You've played sure. Risk. Okay. War is nothing like Risk. You know what I mean? You can have more than 12 armies on one country. If you own a continent, you don't get bonus armies. They don't just parachute from the sky, right? But it's it's a game, right? We have fun. It's it's the rules of that game, and it, it, it's, it's make-believe, right? And so I think that's why you see, like, this big push over the years for, like, um, indie games, independent games, you know, and a lot of stuff that's, like, low-tech. I mean, look at, like, what kids love. They love Minecraft. Yeah. And they love Roblox. And they don't love it because it's realistic. They love it because it's cartoony and it's fun. And so there's like this kind of this pushback in, um, I mean, you see it in toys also. I mean, some of the most popular toys are Funko Pop figures, which look nothing like the characters do in real life or the actors, or you've probably seen like the Alex Ovechkin Funko Pop or like the Sidney Crosby Funko Pop. And they're like super deformed, chibi, cartoony style versions of those players right but they're appealing because they're not realistic they're not a mcfarland figure for what yeah. it's worth you know so anyway 
Doug, let's scale it back to 94. When is the last time you've played it? Uh, I probably played it a couple months ago when I was um, working on an article for Hockey News. I just wanted to remember some things about it. And I also wanted, I needed to get a screenshot of, um, of uh, like the opening screen where Ron Barr welcomes you and any like shows like the player matchups. Because um, one of the things I mentioned in my article for hockey news. And it was like seven fun facts about NHL 94, 10 fun facts. I think it was 10 fun facts. I can't remember. And I didn't lost count of how many fun facts I put into that article, but um, one of the facts, yeah, it was 10. One of the facts was um, th- how the ducks and the Panthers appear on their old teams in, in uh, the Genesis version. Right. So I needed a screenshot of, like the matchup showing John Van Beesbrook on the Rangers versus John Van Beesbrook on the Panthers, you know, and it was just kind of funny how, you know, you could, you could have like a goalie play against himself, or you could even have like a skater hit himself. If you like had them, you know, if you were playing like, you know, whatever team Scott, uh, Scott Mellonby was like on the flyers before he was on the Panthers. Right. So if you played Panthers versus flyers, you could, you could have that match up against have them face off against themselves. You could still do that in the NES version though. If you had the all-star team, one of the all-star teams play off against, you know, say the yeah, East. you can, but that's kind of expected. It's kind of, we- yeah. And that, yeah, you can absolutely. Yeah. You can have Gretzky versus Gretzky. Yeah. Right. Totally do that. And that, that that's kind of funny, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess if if you're playing an all-star team versus, like, another team, you kind of expect that. But, like, yeah, if you're just, like, playing with, like, rosters, that you know, like, just two regular teams, you think the rosters would be a little more, well, as good as they could be. The Genesis version came out first, so the SNES version is more up-to-date because it just came out later. It was based on the Genesis version. The, the programmer for the SNES version basically took the Genesis version, and then ported it over to, uh, to to Super Nintendo. So you are impartial. You prefer to play the SNES version because that's what you had growing up, and you, you tended to play that over the years. So if you had a choice to pick and choose between the SNES versus the Genesis in 94, you're sticking with the SNES version? Well, yeah, but, I mean, part of it is because the music is just so much better. Have you heard the theme, the intro theme for NHL 94 on SNES? Absolutely. I, I played it a few days ago uh, on the, my emulator here. So, yeah, it, it is different. Um, it's pretty epic, man. I mean, compared to the, the Genesis one, just kind of like, I, I get that it didn't have the same sound technology. That's what Genesis people are always like, oh, it didn't have the same sound chips. And it came out a couple, you know, Genesis came out in like 91 and SNES or maybe 89. I mean, Genesis it did come was, out in 89 or maybe yeah. even 88 in Japan, but certainly 89 it was there. Right, yeah, and, it, and SNES didn't come out until, like, 91 in the U.S., right. so, like, it, it had a couple of years, you know, it, to, like, improve upon the technology, but, you know, I, I listen to NHL 94, and I'm just like, this music rocks, you know, and then I listen to, like, the, the Genesis version, and I go, oh, this puts me to sleep. <laughs> I see that. That's funny, because I've played... 99% of my NHL 94 career has been playing on the Genesis version, so when I hear the SNES version... I give it credit. It does sound good, but for whatever reason, just because of familiarity, I prefer the Genesis version. So I guess because I've been yeah. trained, I, I, you know, it's just I've been brainwashed to to like that better over time. But either way, yeah, it's you talk, okay. yeah, it's teach. They're, they're both great games and a lot of fun. And you know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say one is better than the other. I, I've talked to people on both sides of the fence, and I think everybody's just happy we're playing the game still because mm-hmm. there is a, a, an online community. You, you're aware of that that there's a mm-hmm. Discord. Sal, you got to get into it, man. You got to start playing and start joining in. I just don't have the time. You know, I I, I am really just kind of like a, a casual gamer. I mean, one thing I did do is I um I backed on Kickstarter that ODR Hockey Heroes game. That's like an independent game. I don't know if you're aware of that, but it's like I've a, seen pictures of it. I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. And that looks that looks like a lot of fun. And it, it has kind of like a story mode, but it also has like an arcade mode. And it's like a like a two on two or three on three, you know, and it's meant to be like a very pick up and play kind of game. Um, and I know NHL 94 is like that, but I just, um, you know, I, I, I like talking about the game. I'll play a game every now and then, but I just don't feel like I commit could commit to a season. That's and that's fair. not fair to, you know, the opponents who are like, come on, Sal, yeah. it's Sunday night. We got to get our game in. And it's like, ah. <laughs> 
it, it, I guess, it, yeah, if you're in that situation, it would be more like a chore rather than anything else. That's fair. So uh, you wrote, I want to talk about one of the articles you wrote. I want to talk sure. about actually quite a few of them, but you wrote one about the 25th anniversary back in 2018. And I read the article. I want to know, did you end up talking at that time? Did you talk to Mark Lesser or Michael Brook when you wrote that article? I talked to both of them. And coming away from it, like, what were your thoughts about talking? Because they're legendary in the game of 94. So, like, what did you take away from talking to them? I mean, Brook is a big hockey fan. He loved the, the Flyers in the 70s. And uh, he loved that, like, run and gun, rough and tumble, hard hitting style of play. Um, and it was just funny because the way I met him was just so by chance. You know how the um, there was that NHL 94 set of trading cards? Yes. He actually got the set here next to me if we talk about that. So I got, got it on hand. But, like, um, uh, for some reason, they didn't do six cards of the Rangers players. They did six cards of every team, and they only did five cards of Rangers players. And um, so I – on my puck junk blog, I did, I do this series called the lost cards about hockey cards that were supposed to come out, but didn't. And I said, well, that card should have been as a ticket in, but instead in its place was another designer tip card. So then I made like a custom as a ticket in card. And I said, this is what it would look like. I don't know why he wasn't included in the set. And then like one day, Mark Lesser, uh, sorry. Um, uh, Michael, Brook? Mark Le- Michael Brook comments leaves a, a comment in my blog post. And he's like, this was a great story. Thank you. But honestly, we just overlooked Essa Ticken and it was just a total overlook on our part. <laughs> so then I reached out to him a, a couple of years later and I said, Hey, I'm writing this article. I'll hold up one of the cards. Um, one of the NHL 94 cards, but um, you know, and I said, I'm doing this article for hockey news. Would you talk to me? He's like, yeah, of course. I mean, and, and so I talked with him, then he got me in touch with Mark Lesser. And then I was able to find Amory Wong who did the programming for the SNES version. And then I talked with like one of the composers on the soundtrack. And I talked with like anybody that I could, like I left no stone unturned. That just, that became like a total passion project for me. The fact that the hockey news was like, yeah, okay, you can write an oral history about NHL 94. And they were, like, all for it. Like, they weren't just like, eh, okay, maybe. Write it on spec and we'll see. I had written a few oral histories by then. I did one about the movie Sudden Death. I did another one about the movie Young Blood. I did another one about the Mighty Ducks movie. So then I was like, for the next one, I'm like, I want to do a video game instead of a, instead of a movie. And they're like, yeah, okay, go for it. You know, and it was it was a it was a good article. And I say that because I talked with a lot of people and I got a really solid picture of how the game came to be and all the factors that influenced it and kind of made it what it was. You know, it wasn't just like this game came out and people loved it and the weight bug. I mean, that's mentioned, but all the other stuff that goes into it from like the consulting that Barry Melrose did, you know, or, or uh, John McIntyre, who was also on the Kings, he's credited Mm -hmm. as a, as a special thanks. So I, you know, I talked to him as well, you know, um, to Jeremy Roenick. um, And of course, even Andy Moog, who's on the cover of the, the photo, the photo on the the box, you know? So yeah, Yeah. it was, it was a good, it was a good, yeah. But talking with Mark and, uh, and uh, Mike, they, that was, uh, that was great to talk to them, of course. There's a bit of a, a legend around Ken Baumgartner and the fact that he was part of the NHL PA and he was one of the low, lowest ranking players in NHL 93 or NHL PA 93. And so there was something to do with like him being such a low ranked player and going to 94. They're not going to make the players that low rank because he, you know, grant, granted he was a goon. He wasn't a dummy. I believe he was a college graduate. I could be wrong in that, but he certainly had a head on his shoulders. He wasn't just a guy with, out there with some fists that are just ready to fight. But did you end up talking to Baumgartner at all? About- I didn't talk to Baumgartner. I just uh, heard Michael Brooks' account of the story because what had happened was the uh, Players Association was looking over the game you know, for approval, and he's waiting out in the lobby. And then when they're done, Baumgartner walks up to him and says, yeah, I'm, hi, I'm Ken Bar- Gam- Bar- Baumgartner. I'm the guy you gave a zero for intelligence. And that was the stat was intelligence. And he said, you know, okay, at that point, I realized we had to take this a little more serious. And 
maybe intelligence wasn't the right word. Maybe it was offensive awareness. Cause then, you know, they had like offensive awareness and defensive awareness, but before that they had intelligence. And he's like, look, this guy had like one point in like 70 games. He's not going to really help your team win. But uh, yeah, that was, that was the story, but I'm, I'm, I'm retelling the story from, right. So it's, I'm, it's not firsthand. I'm not a firsthand source on that. No, I thought it was rather funny, and, and also the fact that I mean, uh, I just want to reiterate, Baumgartner was is no dummy. Like he he is <laughs> rather intelligent. Um, so yeah, but that's a. I mean, and, and it's funny too because I mean, you look at like say George Peros went to Princeton, captain their hockey team. Sean Cronin, he went to the University of Illinois of Chicago. He played on the UIC Flames back when Chicago had an NCAA Division One hockey program. But when he played for the Winnipeg Jets, he was an enforcer. They called him Cronin yeah. the Barbarian, right? And then even look at like Stu Grimson. I mean, when he retired, what did he do? He went to law school. The guy's a lawyer, right? So yeah, it's it's definitely a, a, a stereotype. I didn't know that Grimson went to the law school. Imagine getting represented by the Grim Reaper in, in when you go to the court. That'd be pretty funny. Like, that would, I, I that would be pretty funny, yeah. <laughs> you talked to JR about I did a couple times, honestly. I talked to him for I talked to him for the game's uh, 20th anniversary. I did an interview with him for Beckett Hockey Magazine. And then I talked with him in 2018 for the 25th anniversary article that I wrote for the Hockey News. And then I also talked to him, this was unrelated, but for like a Blackhawk convention article. Mm -hmm. So I've talked to him a few times. He's he's cool. I mean, what else am I going to say? He's one of my favorite players growing up. So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he was, and he's an absolute legend in the game at that too. I mean, he is well aware of the fact that he. I mean, he, at that time when you spoke with him for a few years back, was he even aware that his status within the NHL community, NHL ninety four community, that he is in a godlike level? Because now, obviously, he knows. But back then, was he aware at that time too? No, I don't think he really understood it until uh, the scene in Swingers with Vince Vaughn playing in the NHL. Well, they're actually playing, as you know, NHL PA 93, but yep. they're like, Oh, they took fighting out of this game. You can't make Gretzky's head bleed anymore, but, or whatever. But like, um, yeah, I mean, now he knows that. And he, he talks about, you know, you, you talk to him about it and he'll say, yeah, he's like, if I had like a dollar for every time somebody broke, uh, brought that up to me, I'd never have to work again. <laughs> which is funny. I don't think he has to work again anyway, but you know what I mean? Like he just, and he goes, you know what? That's okay. It's my claim to fame. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty cool to be liked for something outside of your career and something positive, you know, like being ranked up there with like Mike Tyson and Mike Tyson's punch out or Sonic mm -hmm. the Hedgehog or Super Mario or Bo Jackson and Temco Bowl or whatever. Right. Like it's, it's, he thinks it's a cool thing. At least what he's told me about it a couple times. And he's now a Hall of Famer, just recently been selected as a... About or, time, man. About time. Yeah, how many years has he been on the ballot? Well, he retired at the close of the 8 9 season, so he would have been eligible in 2012. So about 12 years. So he probably, if he didn't make it this time, he probably didn't have too many opportunities left because you don't stay on forever. On the ballot. Well, no, what's happening though is like you'll notice, like, was it last year Doug Wilson was inducted or two years ago? But he so, deserves, he was a great player and he's been a great uh, office guy too and general manager. So, like, he, he's covered both sides of the fence. So, Doug Wilson but, definitely deserves to get in. No, I'll tell you what happened. Um, Doug Wilson used to be the player representative for the Chicago Blackhawks in the Players Association. And I believe, don't quote me on this but I believe he was even the NHLPA president at one time, or maybe not president. Well, I know they have like a CEO or whatever, but as far as like the player reps go, he was up there because Doug Wilson is a smart man. Obviously mm -hmm. we've seen that as the GM for the Sharks. So the thing is, is that when you have a player who's beyond being a player, he's one of the player reps. The player reps are who goes to war with the owners whenever there's a strike, whenever there's a lockout, whenever there's some sort of disagreement between the players and the owners, right? So Wilson was blacklisted for a long time. What happened now is a lot of the old selection committee people in the Hall of Fame have retired or died 
you know, or moved on, you know, I mean, it was, it's old, right? Hockey, hockey has a long memory for things, right? So they'll be like, oh, Wilson, we're not going to vote for that guy. He was the guy who stood up to Bill Wirtz and did that. You know, another thing, like the way Wilson ended up on the Sharks, he basically strong-armed a trade to get on the Sharks because he had a no trade clause. He told Mike Keenan, the coach and GM of the Blackhawks, I'm not going to play for you anymore. So I can retire or you could trade me. Well, he was an asset. So of course he was going to trade him for something, but he said, I'll only approve a trade to the Sharks. Why? Because he knew when he retired, he'd be able to get a job with the Sharks. Easier to get a job with the Sharks than the Red Wings, you know, especially in 93, you know, team that hasn't been around that long. So, you know, now you've got guys like Lanny McDonald who played against Doug Wilson and said, this guy's awesome. He should be in the Hall of Fame. I'm not quoting Lanny on that, but I'm saying they were peers. Lanny doesn't care that Doug was a player rep because they were peers of each other. They played around the same time together. And so um, you're, you're getting that now. Same thing with Ronick. Ronick spoke his mind. Ronick wanted to be paid what he was worth. That's why he got traded to the Coyotes. That left a, a bad taste, not with the fans, but with the Blackhawk organization. And when you have somebody like when Bill Wirtz was alive, he still had a lot of pull in the league, even though um, he was no longer chairman of the board as far as the, the owners go, right? So that's the thing. We're starting to see guys like uh, Ronick and Wilson and probably other players who should have been in it, but maybe they were like blacklisted. But the, the thing is, is that the Blackhawks ownership and the You've heard of Alan Eagleson, right? Sure. So Eagleson, who was in charge of the Players Association and, and robbing the players, Bill Wirtz, the owner of the Blackhawks, and then uh, uh, Ziegler, the uh, former president of the NHL, they were all like this. The three of them worked in cahoots with each other to kind of basically keep salaries down, uh, keep the free agency rules prohibitive. And, um, you know, and then when you have players who stand up for, for themselves and say, no, this needs to change. Well, of course the powers that be are not going to like that. And boy, we went way off topic here. And I'm sorry. No, that's an interesting topic because I, I haven't done, I'd be honest. I had no idea Ziegler, Eagleson and Wirtz were in cahoots. This, I know I watched hockey at that time. This, we're talking the late eighties and mid eighties too, but I, I still don't understand. I still don't know the history of that. And I, I find it to be rather fascinating. I mean, Unfortunately for the players, they felt the brunt of it, and still to this day, we're still they're still trying to correct measures that were uh, instituted on them. Like it's it's just too bad, but yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't by coincidence that Bobby Orr ended up on the Chicago Blackhawks in '76. Alan Eagleson was Bobby mm. Orr's agent, and he was in cahoots with Bill Wirtz. So Bill Wirtz wanted to get Bobby Orr partially because they were upset that they traded Phil Esposito to the Bruins. And then the Bruins, you know, uh, did really well, won those two Stanley Cups. And Phil Esposito rewrote the scoring record. But this was a grudge, you know, this was a grudge going back, you know, 10 years. But on top of that, though, the Blackhawks wanted to get rid of Phil Esposito in the first place because he was a big body, but he didn't play like a big man. You know what I mean? And they wanted him to, like, be like a more of like a power forward, more of like a muck it up in front of the net kind of guy. and you know, when Espo got to play his own game, he flourished, you know? So it's just, it's, it's funny how all of that just kind of works, how uh, you have something from the sixties that influences the seventies, that influences the eighties, that influences the nineties. I mean, even like another thing that the players, um, when there was the, uh, player strike of 92, that was over hockey cards and to a greater extent, the control of the likeness rights, because they weren't getting paid for, um, they weren't getting paid for being put in the video games. Is that the strike you're talking about in '94 or '94, '95 was a was a lockout from the owners. The 90, CBA ran out, and then I guess they locked them yeah. out. That was the situation. Exactly. So in '92, what happened was in like April of '92, um, hockey cards. Hockey cards used to account for about a million dollars of revenue. You had Tops, you had OPG. Not too many people were collecting in the 80s. I mean, a lot of people collected in the 80s, but it wasn't like the 90s or now, you know. So by 92, that amount of revenue that hockey cards was generating was like $14 million. 
So it went from $1 million to $14 million in a two-year span, right? The players used to get all of that money. Now that all of a sudden it was $14 million, the league wanted some of that money. They wanted a lot of that money because remember at the time, the NHL in America was shown on Sports Channel. And for the 91-92 season, they only made $5 million for that television contract. Mm-hmm. So the NHL is making $5 million for its broadcast rights in the U S meanwhile, the players are getting $14 million in revenue for hockey cards. So that was part of it. But then also like, think like, why did NHL hockey not have player names in it? Because the NHL did not let the players know that that was something that was available to them. The NHL and the NHL PA used the same licensing company to license merchandise uh, it was uh, Time Warner. So when they went to Time Warner and they said, hey, we're making this video game, Time Warner's like, well, you can have the NHL rights, but not the Players Association rights. In 93, what happened for NHLPA 93, Michael Brook went directly to the Players Association. He didn't go through their licensing agent. He went directly to them and said, hey, I really want to put you guys in this video game. And they said, what video game? We don't know anything about this. We'd love to be in this video game. Oh, and there's money in it too. Great. You know what I mean? So that was um, that that was kind of like the beginning of, of, I don't want to say the beginning of that turmoil because it was already, there was already turmoil, but this was just throwing gasoline on a fire. Like, wait, we could have made money to be in this video game and you didn't tell us? What else are you hiding from us, right? So then that ended up in a lawsuit that um, I believe it got settled out of court. I don't know enough about that lawsuit itself. But yeah, so I mean, there there was a reason why you had stuff like that. Or, you know, you had like games that had like no player names, team right. names with no player names or player names with no team names because they were just working independently of each other. So you touched on cards. I think that's a good segue to the NHL 94 trading cards that you have, because you said right beside you, you have the set of those cards. How did you manage to get your hands on that? Oh, I mailed away for it. Like we were supposed to, right? Like it, there, it came, the super Nintendo version came with a poster. I wasn't able to dig it out, but I'm sure you've seen it at least once. Uh, it basically looked like this, but I don't know. It looked similar to this, but it was, no, it was a, it was a poster that had like an action shot. I didn't dig it out. But then the game also came with this this uh, promotional card that, um, you know, said that you could buy the game. It had like the, you know, how to buy on the back. And at this point, I, I think I had just gotten my first checking account. So anything I could buy, I would. You know what I mean? Like, I'll write a <laughs> check for that. No, because, you know, like when you're a kid, you're like, Mom, I need a check for yeah. $1 to get a free Cobra Commander figure. And she's like, you, get a, you have enough toys, you know, and. And, and, and whatever, but right, like so, I mailed away for for it. I wish I bought like five of the sets, but I only bought one because I only needed one. Still have the box that it came in, um, but yeah, that's how I got it. I just it was on my radar. I'm like, oh my god, a hockey card set based on a video game. I'm I'm in. You know, I I've, I've been collecting hockey cards almost as long as I've been a hockey fan. Like, I think I probably bought. Let's see, I went to my first NHL game in February, and I probably bought my first pack of cards in March so <laughs> of 89. So, you know, not, not too long after. And you say your favorite year to collect cards was 93, 94. Is that correct? Yeah, there's just a lot of good stuff going on that year. You had NHL 94. You had the first year of starting lineup hockey figures. You had a lot of great hockey card sets like Upper Deck, Don Russ, Leaf. Uh, Fleer Power Play, which were like these tall boy cards. So there was just a lot of there was just a lot of good stuff that year. Just wasn't NHL '94. That was just like the icing on the top, but not really because that was a substantial part of it. But like, yeah, there was just a lot of great stuff going on um, that year for hockey. And plus, the Hawks were still a a, uh, very good, a very very competitive team. You know, just a, a couple of years earlier, they, as you mentioned, finished first overall in the points and. The next year they went to the finals and I think they didn't get swept. Did they fight the penguins? Oh yeah, they did. Big they time. Got swept. Sorry about that. Yeah, they got yeah, no, man. The scars run deep, you know. Um <laughs> even Hasek played. I remember Hasek had a little bit of time to they bench Bell for, I think, in one of the games, and Hasek ended up doing his thing. Yeah, um, and he, he played all right. You know, they could have you know, the Blackhawks really didn't lose because of Bell 
No, no, it was they were up against a, a, a team that was just destined to win. No, but I think games two and three, I want to say they were like one to nothing wins or something. I mean, they were pretty good. I mean, if you can't score a goal, you can't blame your goalie. Yeah. Whether you lose three to nothing or one to nothing, you can't blame the goalie if you don't score any goals. It's, 100%. Yeah. You know, I'll show you this really quick as long as I got this open. Yeah. The, the card set has a card. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. Here it is. Local organ music. <laughs> and on the back of the card, it says here, uh, Drive the Fans Crazy NHL 94 uh, includes over 70 pieces of new digitized digitized organ music, uh, blah, 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 by uh, Sor- San Jose Sharks organist Dieter Rule exclusively for EA Sports. So it's like, okay, Dieter Rule who I spoke with for my article, he should really have been in this card set and said they show an Islanders player. I'm not sure who that is. Looks like a What's player. the number? It looks like 30 something. 35, 30, 30. Is this Mark Fitzpatrick? Could be. Yeah, I, I think so. Right. So it's just not a great card. So when I talked with him, he showed me this and he sent me one at the Dodgers game. They uh. made a card of him. It looks like an old Don Russ baseball card from it does, right? You know, but I'm just like, oh my god, he actually does have a trading card. So I put this with my NHL '94 set because that's where it that's where it belongs. Sal, what other goodies do you have beside you that you want to show off? All right, let's see here. This <laughs> because I fear I'm not going to bring it up, and it was going to be a missed opportunity. I want to. <laughs> at no, least no, no, no. Show... So I'll show you. Okay, so I got two other pieces of NHL '94 things that I think are pretty cool. One is the uh, official guide. I, I've Somebody was talking about this. Uh, who's What's the author's name? Um, I think this was talked about very recently in the Discord. Corey Sandler. Yes. yes. Yeah, I, I also I, mentioned it in my uh, 10 fun facts about NHL 94 article. Um, you know, most of it's in black and white, you know. Right. Um, it's, it's, I honestly, I bought this book a couple of years ago. I haven't read it cover to cover. I'm probably never going to. I mean, if I had this in 93, of course, I would have been pouring over this. But like, you know, now, I mean, it's got some color pages inside of it as well. It, it's just more yeah. of like a collector's item. Um, 100%. I, you know, just kind of bought it for that reason. Um, so that was, uh, you know, it's got like stats and everything. But what's interesting is that the guy has his own kind of rating system that's kind of loosely tied around like the, uh, the, the ratings in the game, but uh, it's kind of like his own metrics for stuff. And I didn't really get too much into it, but I was like, huh, this is kind of interesting, you know, like, but uh, yeah, this, this was a cool thing. The other thing is the, PC version of NHL 94. Yes. It was called NHL Hockey. And old computer games in the 90s, they came out in these big boxes, right? So this is the box that it came in. It comes in a slip case, right? And so, like, you know, like, the comes with the... Uh, this is actually not... I don't think this is an instruction manual. No, it is an instruction manual, but it also... Is like those old NHL guide and record books uh-huh. that have um, like literally like it gives you like, you know, here's Wayne McBean's stats, right? Like it, it has like a player register for like everybody who played the previous year. So you could actually just look up and say like, hey, how did Corey Millen do? Oh, OK. In 91, 92, he got one goal and four assists with the Kings and then he got. Uh, 20 goals and 21 assists for 41 points in 44 games with the Kings. That's or 46 games. That's pretty good. You know what I mean? Like, so you could actually like do your homework and see how the players did. Remember, folks, this was before Hockey DB. You're right. That's a good so, inclusion in, for buying the game. But again, if you think about like the early history of like sports gaming in uh, for for computers, a lot of it was simulations. Those original Madden games were simulations. You know, you had like the original Wayne Gretzky hockey uh, that came out in 88 or whatever was like 
got, won an award for like best sports simulation of the year. So they were very much based on stati- statistics and analysis and, 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 and simulation and not so much about like, Hey, is this a fun game to just pick up and play? You know what I mean? But here's the other thing I needed to show you about this. I'm saving the best for last. So on the cover is a Hartford Whaler. And that Hartford Whaler is Steve Conroy, who used to play for the Chicago Blackhawks. After he retired, he ended up being a color commentator. And one year at a Chicago Blackhawk convention, I actually got him to sign the Ah, cover of the game. Very cool. And he was so excited to see this. I mean, he got (laughs) like, it's funny because like my girlfriend at the time, she like, we didn't shoot video, but she shot like a bunch of pictures really fast, like using like the burst mode. So uh-huh. I made like this animated GIF of like me handing him the the game and him uh-huh. smiling, like getting a big smile. And he's like, he picks it up and like shows it to the person next to him, you know, because he's like so geek, like, yeah, I was on the cover of this game, you know, like so, um, which which is funny because it was just such a random picture. And I don't know why they didn't use the same photo of uh, Andy Moog like they did on the SNES and Genesis versions, but that, that's neither here nor there. It's just part of the lore of the game, you know? One game that has no lore it, because it was never released, it's called Road to the Cup Hockey 94. If I Yes. Ah, it seemed like this had a lot of promise. It seemed like this is, would have been... I don't want to say uh, a challenger to NHL life, or perhaps it may have been, but at the very least, this never came to fruition. So what could you talk about this game? Because a lot of people aren't aware of it, but there, there is some history here that is tied into NHL 94. So I, first of all, I need to thank the people on the NHL94.com message boards because they first made me aware of this where somebody found an old Usenet post of some guy who posted his resume. And one of the things that he listed on his resume, he was a video game programmer, that he worked on an unproduced game called Road to the Cup Hockey 94. And so I looked up that guy. I ended up interviewing him. He did one version of the game. And then I ended up talking to the guy who did the other version of the game because there was a Genesis programmer and an SNES programmer. And they were working for Park Place Productions. Uh-huh. So 90 NHL hockey and NHL PA hockey 93 were produced by Park Place. They were the EA was the publisher, but Park Place was the one who actually rolled up their sleeves and did the programming. Um, EA ended up hiring away the programmer from NHL hockey and NHL hockey, NHL PA hockey 93. Uh, Jim Simmons, I believe, is his name. Mm-hmm. So they hired that programmer away to come work for EA. So uh, they were doing it in-house, right? So Park Place decided that they were going to continue to uh, make hockey games. So their new game was going to be called Road to the Cup Hockey 94. They were producing two versions of the game, but Park Place like missed deadlines and they over promised and under delivered and they just basically got into financial uh financial mess uh, a big financial mess and they were working with another company called Electrobrain who was another uh, game company at the time so like that was I, I guess that's who the publisher was going to be and um what i understand is that they've really worked on the ai for the game like one of the guys who was responsible for the game he had like all these decision trees and they basically broke up the ice into like the the offensive zone, the defensive zone, and the neutral zone. They broke up into six portions. And then they basically said, okay, now how would your forward behave if he was in the offensive zone, left-hand corner, and had the puck or didn't have the puck? Or what if he was between the, the circle and the blue line? What would he do with the puck without the puck, right? Like, So there were all these like different AI decision trees. And it was supposed to be a pretty elaborate game for its time with all this different AI that they were trying to put into it or AI, you know what I mean? Not like yeah. AI today, but where it learns how to do poetry or whatever, but like, just like decision trees, right. To, to make it challenging, to make it more realistic. What is interesting about this is that somewhere along the line, cause it was supposed to be a top down view, like NHL 94, NHL PA 93. 
is uh, an actual let me backtrack. They might have even been able to reuse assets from those games because they were able to reuse assets in other games. Like there was Joe Montana football and there was Madden football. And they used a lot of the same things. They kind of dumbed it down for Joe Montana football, but it was like the same graphics, just not as good. You know, maybe not as much shadowing or whatever and like Mm -hmm. same, like similar interfaces and stuff. So it it was not quite a copy of it, but, you know, and they were able to repurpose their graphics from one game for another game. So there is, it could have been, it could have looked like NHL 94. The thing is, is that somewhere along the line, they started adding a side view and the programmers don't know why, like, wait, why are we adding a side view? And it was because they were in negotiations with ESPN to make the ESPN national hockey night game. And so that's why they started adding this alternate camera view. Now what ended up happening was NHL or ESPN national hockey night came out but uh, there's a rumor that it reused code from Road to the Cup 94. Oh, so there is, it's, it's carried on at least. Yeah. In a rumor because that, that, you know what, like the programmers are like, you know what, we wouldn't know because we didn't work on it. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people jump ship from one company to another company and, you know, th- you know, people copy f- files and bring them with them, you know, things get purchased, this and that, you know what I mean? So like, there's a rumor and there, and he's like, that's why I think we added that side view because it was going to get used. That code would have gotten reused for national hockey night, but uh, you know, we don't know. So it's, it, it could have happened. It might've happened. It might not. If, if road to the cup hockey 94 came out, it could have looked like an NHL 94 game. It could have been like an NHL 94 clone. That's what they were going for. Um, as far as they got, in the game, they previewed a demo of it at the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago in 1993. No, I did not go. That was the first year it was open to the public, but I was like a senior in high school, and it was like the furthest thing from my mind. But I was told that they had a demo set up of the game, but all you could really do was kind of skate around and, and pass and shoot the puck, and like it was just terrible. But they had to have something to show, and, and so that was, you know, the guy telling me this, you know, 25 years later, he doesn't really remember right. if it looked exactly like NHLPA Hockey 93 or not, but same idea. The fact that they had something to showcase at, at the convention goes to show that at least there's a possibility the code may be available. You know, it may be in a wild somewhere. I, granted, it's very unfinished, unpolished. In, in, insert whatever description you want to have, but still, I, I wonder if there's a possibility somebody has this in their basement uh, on a three and a half inch floppy somewhere. And, and we could just maybe see this once again and get some daylight and just show it to the world and see what, what it potentially could have been. I, I would love to see if that's even a possibility. Um, but maybe just, you know, me being hopeful who the heck knows. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's just funny how that, uh, you know, the, the two programmers said that they didn't have it. So yeah, if they don't have it, I don't know who would, you know, and, that's too bad. How would you even play it without the right emulation hardware? I'm sure you know. There's a lot of bright people out there. If there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely, um, absolutely, yeah. So I, I, we're closing in. Actually, we're past an hour. So hmm. um, I guess I, I have one final question for you before we sign off. Can we talk about the graphic over my shoulder oh, too? Do that, man. I, I don't want to. I don't even want to say who they are. Everybody knows who they are. But go ahead. Everybody knows who they are. So I sell my own original t-shirt designs at shop.puckjunk.com. I drew this um, illustration, you know, influenced by one of my favorite, if not my all-time favorite hockey video game of a certain player body checking another certain player. Um, For the audio side, it's JR checking uh, Gretzky Gretzky, and NHL 94. We're number 27 in a red jersey, laying out 99 in a white jersey. But yeah, Gretzky and and, and Roenick. And um, I uh, sell that at shop.puckjunk.com. It's called 16-Bit Body Check. And uh, yeah, you can check it out there if you see this graphic over my shoulder and go, yeah, that's pretty cool. I'd wear that on a t-shirt. So that's uh, that's why I'm... uh, 
pimping it. So what's your uh, what's your last? No, question? no, I have one question to do with the T-shirt. Then what's the color sure. of it? Is it, is it going to be the ice? That blue colored ice is that's the base color of the shirt. Yeah. So the the color that's the color of the shirt. Um, the problem is is that you're limited to a certain amount of colors. Like, and this one actually, the, as far as like my costs go, this shirt cost me a lot because it uses seven different colors. It looks like there's more colors and that's because I mix certain colors together by basically um, like checkerboarding two different colors, like black and red to make like a darker red. I mean, this isn't like a trade secret. Like people who do this sort of stuff know this sort of stuff. Right? I see you know six. I mean? so, like with Untrained Nine, I could see six colors right off the bat. Oh um, well, there's there's red, white, and black. Yes, the there's stick green. The green, yeah. So the stick color that that brownish. The, the brown, yep. And then there is uh, the blue of the shadow. Ah, see, I missed that. Okay. And then there's um, there is a different gray. I do make some gray with half toning, but I had to use another gray as well. Like I, you know, I did everything I could, you know, you try to find that balance of like how few colors can I use versus what looks good, you know? And I played around with different skin tones. I think the skin tone is also one color. I'm not, no, I think the skin tone is a mixture between white and um, white and uh, red, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'd have to look at the artwork again. Um, mm -hmm. that I sent to the the printer, but yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. Cause like I make these other, uh, t-shirts that look like old trading card wrappers and, um, I got one, but it's outside, it's beyond my arm's reach, but, uh, I, uh, you know, and those might use like five, six colors. Cause those are looking more like they're trying to be like seventies or eighties, you know, but, you know, but then again, I'm a designer, so I want to use as many colors as I can. But then, like, if you use too many colors, then it's a different printing process. And then that, like, you know, then that increases your 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 cost. And then it's just like, well, I'm not producing, you know, a million of these like Nike would. If it was a Nike garment, they would cost next to nothing. But, mm -hmm. you know, I print 100 at a time because that's the minimum I can do. But then the trade-off is, is that, like, I have to sell T-shirts for $20, $30. But, you know. I sell them at conventions and people love them. I sell them online. People don't love them as much because shipping to Canada is just terrible. Shipping in the U.S. is terrible too, but U.S. to Canada, they just charge us so much money. Again, yeah. off topic here. Now we're getting into the geopolitical sphere. And we don't <laughs> want to do that, but... Uh, we're not going to start any wars, nor will we uh, solve any wars too, so don't worry about that. If somebody wants it, where can they get... What website can they find it at? Shop.puckjunk.com. So Perfect. my puckjunk.com website, there's a shop. You can just click on the shop button or you can just go to shop.puckjunk.com, whatever is easier to remember. I'm going to add that to the show notes. But I guess cool. the final question I have is, you're a fan of The Simpsons or not? Yeah, I mean, I as much as anybody was growing up in the 80s and the 90s, I mean, I watched it in the very beginning and then I kind of lost track of it. Like after I graduated college, then it maybe wasn't as much of a priority. Yeah, kind of the same with me, but... There was one episode, and I think you watched it as well because we're kind of near of the same vintage. Homer J. Simpson was trying to go through this quest to find out what J stood for. And he ended up finding out it stood for J, J A Y. So for yeah. <laughs> I want to know what does the J stand for stand for in Sal J. Barry? Okay, that's all right, Joseph. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, there's no there's no surprise there, but actually I I I I started telling people it stands for genius, like with a J, <laughs> but not, okay. So I do, I do my hockey writing. I do my hockey podcasting. I've also started doing stand up comedy. Mm -hmm. So like on Instagram, I'm at puck junk for my hockey stuff. But then when I started doing stand up comedy, that didn't really fit. Cause that's all like pictures of hockey cards and stuff like that. Right. So I started a separate Instagram under Sal J Barry because Sal Barry was taken. So, uh -huh. so I was like, all right, well, I'll use my middle initials. So Sal J Barry. And then I'm just like, all right. And then now when I do comedian, you know, comedy, I'll be like, you know, follow me on Instagram at Sal J Barry. The J is for genius. Right. So that's funnier than saying the J is for Joseph, but yeah, it's, it's for Joseph. Sorry. I I just wanted to know. I wanted to scratch that itch. So, uh, Sal, I, I want to thank you for taking time to come on and chat about 
NHL 94, video games, hockey, and a whole bunch of other things. So I really appreciate you doing this. It's been a lot of fun. Len, thank you. This was a pleasure to just get to to, to be on a podcast, but now I don't have to worry about editing it and post-production and, and cutting out ums and stuff like that. So the pleasure is all mine. Well, thank you. So any last words, anything else? Yeah, I'm going to throw the baton over to you before we close off, like where people can find you. Yeah, uh, if, you like, here, if you like hockey cards and hockey culture, please check out my blog, puckjunk.com. If you like hockey cards, especially, I encourage you to check out our podcast at puckjunk.com slash podcast. And I also do a weekly email newsletter about hockey cards and hockey collectibles. And you can find that at puckjunk.com slash newsletter well, thank you very much i'll put those in the show notes so if anybody is looking for them it'll be easy to find so sal thanks so much and with thank that you. keep your stick on the ice controller plugged in we'll be back at this very soon